I wanted to make a video outlining the hardware and software that I've chosen to use in series with an STM32 microcontroller in order to make a, a pretty good oscilloscope. So here's some of the, the hardware I have here. On the top side, where those transistors are, that's protection from over voltage and under voltage conditions, and we'll get into that. As well as with this switch, we have the opportunity to do unipolar and bipolar input sensing. And we do that without the need for a dual power supply, but we'll jump right into the how the clamping circuitry works. So I had several different ideas for current clamping. The first was to use a Zener diode connected backwards to ground with a 1K resistor in series as a current limiting resistor. The idea is, is that when the analog input voltage rises above the Zener voltage, the Zener diode will start conducting backwards to ground and sink the current away from the input. Then we should get our voltage within a spec there, and, and we'll try that out in just a second. The other idea was to use a Schottky diode, and this is the, the bottom one. So you have your analog input connected in series through a 1K current limiting resistor, and then you have your Schottky diode connected to your 3.3-volt uh, rail. So what happens is as the voltage rises above 3.3 volts, it should clamp to that rail. Now, you can imagine if the rail is, doesn't have a load, then you're going to have to put some kind of load on it in order to pull the voltage down. So in my case, I'm using a 1K resistor here, and you'll see that in my circuit. So we'll try both circuits and, and consider how they work. So the first circuit we're going to try is the Zener clamp. So you can see here's our resistor right there that we saw in the schematic. And then we have our Zener diode right there. So this, this voltmeter on the left is the input voltage, and the voltmeter on the right is the voltage on the other side of the current limiting resistor. So the idea we have here is a very high impedance input, so we don't have uh, a high voltage drop across the resistor, because that would mess up our readings from the STM32. So as, as we increase the voltage, we'll, we'll kind of get an idea of what this looks like. So it first looks really good, about the same. But as we, we want it to get up to 3.3 to volts, but as we start to get up to around 3.2, it starts to really grab. Now we can imagine this isn't going to work because we need really high impedance. And it, and it even goes above, you know, 3.63 volts. And we need it to clamp at a max of 3.4 volts, maybe a little bit higher to protect the ADC input. So at 7 volts input, we have 3.63 volts on the output, which isn't quite going to work for us. Um, there's probably some better Zener diodes, but this is what I have. We're now going to try the Schottky diode. Our, our Schottky diode is, is connected just like this to the 3.3 volt rail. And then we have our 1K load resistor. So as we turn up the voltage, we'll see how this solution works. It's so around 3 volts. It, it's very, very good. So this is a lot better than our, our Zener clamp. We can see that the voltages are about equal. And this is an, an order of magnitude that we could be okay with. But as I continue to turn this up, you'll see that the voltage again continues to rise above that 3.3 volt rail. That's not going to quite work for us either. The third solution is, is that we can use transistors to get our high side and low side current clamp. For an NPN transistor, when the voltage of the base is 0.6 volts above the emitter, then a small amount of current flows from the base to the emitter, turning on the transistor and allowing current to flow from the collector to the emitter. For a PNP transistor, if the voltage at the base is 0.6 volts below the emitter, then current flows from the emitter to the base, allowing current to flow from the emitter to the collector. We can actually use this principle for current clamping. So we have our, um, our current limiting resistor here, which will be a 10K resistor. And then we have this right here is our top side clamp. So this is what's going to protect it from an over voltage condition. When the voltage is above 3.3 volts, the transistor starts to turn on, conducting the current to ground. So we've created a reference voltage of about 2.9 volts. And so if we, if we look at our transistor diagram here, as the voltage at the emitter starts to rise above 3.3 volts and our voltage at the base is 2.9 volts, then the, the difference starts to turn on the transistor. Current starts to flow from the emitter to the base. And then we can see in our schematic, then the current starts to flow to the collector. So then we start to sink current away from this into the ground rail here. For the high side clamp, we can see just the opposite. Current flows from the 3.3 volt rail in order to pull up the under voltage condition. So this is our low side clamp. And then we give it a 0.4 volt reference for the transistor base. We'll see that in action here. So right now our input voltage is, is 6.34 volts and our output is 3.45. So that's clamping about where we need. If we turn down the voltage, we'll see it holds it fairly linear. So for 1.22 volts, we see 
And as we approach the 3.3 volt limit, it does a very good job of holding it right there. So you, we can tell the impedance is, is very high for this circuit, which is perfect. And then indeed it clamps at around where we need it to, about 3.4 volts. And we'll do the low side clamp too. So if we flip the power supply, we will see that we have a negative 5 volt input and negative 0.15 volts output so it clamps perfectly for the low side as well so this is a circuit i've chosen to use because i can fine tune it if i want to as well as these are components that are lying around so as i was thinking about measuring bipolar voltages the idea came to just provide a different reference voltage to the output if we would like to see negative voltages and have them appear positive to the microcontroller so it can read them we could provide a reference voltage of 1.65 volts. There's a couple ways we could do this. The thing about this reference voltage is it needs to both be able to source and sync current. Uh, so a simple low dropout regulator by itself isn't quite sufficient. Uh, so I first had a couple ideas. You could just use a plain resistor divider, but a resistor divider is going to have loading effects. The the other idea is to use a bunch of diodes in series, and, and I I put I did this on this board. You can see, you kind of can see it. There's a bunch of diodes here, and they're all wired up in series, and that's what's being used for the reference voltage right now. And the third idea is to use a low dropout regulator with an additional component. The idea is, is that it's going to provide a constant 1.65 volts uh, that current can be sourced from. If the circuit tries to source current to the regulator, the regulator can't sink it away. The idea is, is to use the resistor, a 100 ohm resistor, to ground. What that does is it provides current sinking cap capabilities. It's going to constantly sink 16 and a half milliamps from the regulator, but it also allows for 16 and a half milliamps to be sunk from the probe circuit. The regulator is going to constantly adjust to, to keep the 1.65 volts while both sourcing and sinking current up to 16 and a half milliamps. So we'll, we'll show that on spice and the different characteristics of, of the output. So in order to understand our spice simulation, we have to understand the workings of our oscilloscope. So this half right here is the inside of the oscilloscope. We have a 1K resistor going to our clamping circuitry, and then the outside of our RCA connector is connected to a VREF. On the outside of the uh, oscilloscope, we have a 1K resistor to VREF, and then a 1K resistor to our probe head. So the, the voltage divider is done outside of the oscilloscope. While on traditional oscilloscopes, there's a 1 mega ohm resistor to ground on the inside. What we see here is a 2K resistance from the probe head to VREF. There will be a certain amount of current that flows through from the, the probe head to VREF or from VREF to the probe head at 1.65 volts, which will be the max voltage seen if VREF is 1.65 volts. If we times that by four different channels, if they're all switching at the same time, there's going to be a max current flowing through that, I'm going to test it as 1K with forward parallel. That way we can get, we can overshoot a little bit. So we have 250 ohms resistance that we're going to test. So what I'm going to do is going to connect VREF and then connect 250 ohm resistor and then a square wave on the other side. And we're going to see how it holds up to the different frequencies and how the voltage on the other side of the resistor responds. All right, so here is our circuit simulation. We're testing the resistor divider solution as well as the diode solution. So the diode solution, again, is what I have on my board right now, but I want a better solution than that. Here's our square wave coming in. So if I look a little closer, this is the square wave. Right, so this is what's providing the load. This could be our circuit that we're probing because it's it's inducing a voltage in reference to VREF. So it's putting strain on VREF to hold that 1.65 volts. So now we can probe the other side. There's about 419 millivolt fluctuation there. So that's not that's not uh, good enough for what we need. So we, if we wanted to, we'd have to decrease the resistor divider, which would draw even more current. But we can see how that changes things. So now we're about 128 millivolts, so 0. 0.12 volts, which isn't still isn't quite what I'm looking for. I'm, I'm looking for something a little bit better than that. So if we go check our, out our dialed solution over here, we have our clock coming in. And then we'll see there is our, there, that's our 1.65 volt reference and it's holding up pretty good. Uh, we can see about 15 millivolt fluctuation. That, that's pretty good. I think that's, that's good. But with these diodes, it draws quite a bit of current. 
So upwards of about 60 milliamps, which is sacrificing a lot of energy for 1.65 volt reference. We're gonna ch check out our other circuit now. This is the low dropout regulator circuit. So what we've done here is we have our we have our adjust set to provide us a 1.65 volt output. Then we have a 100 ohm resistor to ground so that this pulse is to represent our circuit switching. Here's our clock coming out and we can check how it looks on the other end. You know, from, from first looks, you can't see any any fluctuation in that. So we'll zoom up a lot closer and see what we can find here. So you see there's just barely, barely fluctuation. If, if this is actually what's going to happen in real life, 700, 650 microvolts, which is absolutely within spec. And if we wanted a good stable 1.65 volts, that could, that could both source and sync current. This method with a 100 ohm resistor drawing a constant 16 and a half milliamps uh, is, a, is a great solution. So this is what I'll use on future versions if I make any future ones. All right, so this is the finished version one uh, oscilloscope. There's some complications that I ran into later and I'll, and I'll talk about those. It's complete with a USB isolator so that we can probe uh, any system. I printed this beautiful case. I have the switch here. So I have a, a bipolar mode to measure uh, negative 1.65 volts to 1.65 volts, and then a 0 to 3.3 volts. So kind of nice to have the range if you need it, or to measure bipolar signals if you need it as well. And the software allows us to adjust. I've also created these probes for the oscilloscope. I used 1.1k ohms and 1.1k ohms for the 2x. So, you know, you might ask, well, why, why such small values of resistance, uh, especially because it's going to cause a lot of loading effects on the circuit you're testing. The reason why is because the STM32 itself, as it samples at high frequencies, it uh, increases the impedance, and so then you need a, a lower impedance output. So on my next version of the oscilloscope, I'm actually going to use an op-amp to buffer the signal before it sends it into the STM32. So before I go into some of the limitations I ran into, I wanted to show the software a little bit. This is the uh, Embedo oscilloscope software. I have um, another STM32 outputting a sine wave here. So we can we can see that coming in really clean. We can put the the cursors here and and see what that what that is. So right there, it shows us one kilohertz. We can increase the frequency to two kilohertz. Uh, we'll see it does really well. Its limitation comes about at a hundred kilohertz. We'll see that it struggles to keep up, especially with that. We'll see a little difference in a, in a square wave. So a square wave looks a little bit different. There's a sawtooth triangle. About 100 kilohertz is its max, but it has a lot of other really neat functions as well. So it's got it's got different trigger levels so we can we can set the the trigger for it and we can just let it run constantly so it has no trigger. We've got got adjust down here so we can move this waveform around. That's how we can uh, measure the bipolar voltages is by moving the waveform down and then amplifying it. So if we had 10x we could Give it 10x like that and then move it down. This is one of the limitations I ran into with the oscilloscope. I'm trying to build a constant current, constant voltage power supply. And I'm doing that by using this um, simple buck converter and then a, an op amp. So what I'm going to do is because the buck converter can only get down to one volt, I'm going to use an op amp to add one volt to the output and that way, and then feed that back in so it gets, it shifts at one volt so it can go all the way down to zero volts. And then the idea is, is I can use a potentiometer to adjust the, the resistor divider ratio back into the feedback pin. I have uh, the input voltage in, in blue, so you can see it go up and down. And then I have the output voltage that I can adjust with this, with this potentiometer right here. So you can see the output voltage and it gets noisy, the top's kind of cool. And I can go all the way down to zero volts. So you can see it kind of fade away there. Let's get a little closer. Then it can slowly come back up. I can drop the input voltage, you can see it starts to flatten out and then kill the output. So I'll get into the interesting thing in just a second, but you have to wonder when you make something like this, well, how am I going to test it? What kind of load am I going to use? So for me, I chose to use a motor, a DC motor, and we'll see how that turns out. All right, so here's my limitation. I find it very interesting. So there's my, my voltages. Again, I'm, I have a, a DC motor as a load inside that plastic bag. So this is the interesting part as I increase the the output voltage, there's a specific point. Where the where the program shuts down. So as, as you could imagine, I was really interested by the fact that 
Uh, it would just die like that. And so I thought, well, maybe, you know, high frequency noise is going through the oscilloscope pins into the oscilloscope. So I spent a bunch of time trying to, to navigate that issue. And then I thought, well, maybe this, this USB isolate over here is the problem. So I tried it without the USB isolator, and indeed it is more stable without. I can get to a little, little more noise, but it still shuts down. So then I thought, well, what if I just completely disconnected the oscilloscope, right? Let's, let's say it's not any of that. So I'll just disconnect this oscilloscope here. Let's see if my software will start back up. Sometimes it does. There we go. And we're going to start running our load again, and we're going to see what happens. It shuts down, and it's it's completely isolated, right? So that's really interesting. So now, you know, for, for just to go even farther, oh, whoops, I killed it. I'll be right back. All right, so to go even farther, farther, let's disconnect this isolator and just go straight into the computer input. Here is our oscilloscope and our load, uh, completely disconnected and no isolation. Start to run the current. So that tells us that um, that the problem isn't with the USB isolator with high frequency noise traveling through the through the inputs. I mean, it could be. But the, the real problem is EMI, so there's electromagnetic fields coming off this motor that are coming in and shutting down the oscilloscope. So we have to put the oscilloscope inside of a can or get like a, a printed circuit board made with a, with a dedicated ground plane uh, to shield it. So that's probably the, the next version that I'm gonna make. I'll show, show you some ideas for that. For the next re revision of the oscilloscope, I wanna use the STM32F303RE and it supports sample rates of up to five mega samples a second. So there's, you can sample four different channels of five mega samples a second which is pretty good for a, for a cheap little microcontroller. I uh, started building um, another board for it. This is before I realized that the EMI issue that I was having. Uh, the, the plan now is to, to make a printed circuit board, but instead of using RCA connectors, I'm actually going to use the BNC connectors that are on um, traditional oscilloscopes. So I have uh, the four channels, and then I break out the PWM outputs, the signal generation outputs, and then the counter, or the counter input. Instead of isolating the USB on this version, I'm going to actually have a dual power supply, I'm going to take the the, the 5 volt input and I'm going to take a DC to DC converter and then create a negative 5 volts with that. And then I'll just use a negative regulator to get negative 3.3 volts. So here's here's a section for the scope. I have my clamping circuitry and you can see here that I am going to provide a reference of negative 2.9 and 2.9, right? So I get our, get our bipolar signals there and, and I, I can have the opportunity of having a negative 2.9 volt reference because of the negative power supply. And I have my op-amp buffer and then in order to scale, I'm actually going to use a resistor divider of 400, 400 ohms. I, I want to bypass the, the buffer when I'm using the logic analyzer. I'm going to have a, a physical sw contact switch. So that's how I'm able to activate the logic analyzer and that, that runs into the scope. And then I have my, my uh, clamp for that. So I, so I can, when, as I do that, I turn on the, the low side clamp because over here it's negative 2.9 volt clamp. And then over here it's zero volt clamp because th it doesn't get scaled when it goes direct through. And then there's some other, some other cool things I do. I'll get into that in the next, um, the next video if I make one. Thank you so much for watching, and stay tuned for the next version. There's going to be a few additional features. If you have any ideas on how to improve the project, leave a comment below or reach out to me.